Hello and welcome back to Root of Rameau's, a poetry series in which we observe the mechanics, aesthetics, and meaning of the greatest founding text of the Western poetic tradition. Today we're continuing our textual analysis of the Epic of Gilgamesh by looking at Tablet 2. As I mentioned last time, I'm reading from the standard Babylonian version, He Who Saw the Deep, as translated by Andrew George. Also, just to clarify, in this section, there are quite a few fragments missing, and so the translator at times incorporates the old Babylonian Pennsylvania tablet and the Yale tablet in order to fully flesh out the narrative. As always, there are timestamps for each topic I cover in the description, so you can use that to navigate the video. If you have any questions throughout the course of the video, feel free to let me know in the comments below. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started with this poetic analysis of Tablet 2. With the beginning of Tablet 2 being fragmented, we have the substitute of the Pennsylvania tablet to fill us in on the narrative. And it picks up right where Tablet 1 left off with Enkidu and Shemat coupling together. Already, we have starting at line P46, while the two of them together were making love, he forgot the wild where he was born. This is a very strong sentiment, as it demonstrates that Shemat is further turning Enkidu away from his domain in the wild. Continuing on, Shemat tells Enkidu he is like a god and wonders why he is with the beasts of the wild. And then she tells him that he should come to Uruk that there is a sacred temple of Enu and of Iana, where men do skilled work, and she says, you too, like a man, will find a place for yourself. So not only has Shemat overcome Enkidu's will through seduction, but she is now seeking to alter the identity of Enkidu, who is the lord of the good place, and brings him into Uruk to make him civilized. To this, Enkidu accepts but look at how his agreement is described, starting line P66. Her words he heard, her speech found favor, the counsel of a woman struck home in his heart. She stripped and clothed him in part of her garment and the other part she put on herself. This is a very moving section, I think because Inkadu was born as an offspring of silence. He has a strong desire to be part of a community. Before, in Tablet 1, line 176 to 177, it reads, Joining the throng with the game at the waterhole, his heart delighting with the beasts in the water. Here, he was happy because he believed he was with his group. This explains why Inkadu had originally rejected the hunter, because at that point, he was without wide understanding, this understanding he had received after coupling with Shamat. So Shamat struck home in Enkidu's heart and proceeds to strip and give him half of her garment. As Shamat sees Enkidu as a god, this is certainly an act of service for him. Additionally, sharing her own clothing with Enkidu is the beginning of his civilizing process. So Shamat brings Enkidu into Uruk, and he is first greeted by the shepherd's camp. They gather around him, and it creates a commotion. They comment on how similar he is to Gilgamesh, and then they proceed to give Enkidu bread and ale. Of course, Enkidu hesitates and is skeptical of the provisions. He doesn't know how to eat bread or how to drink, because he was raised in the wild. Shemat tells Enkidu, line P95, Eat the bread, Enkidu, essential to life. Drink the ale, the lot of the land. So Enkidu eats bread until he's full, and drinks seven goblets of ale. His mood became free, he started to sing, his heart grew merry, his face lit up. This is certainly a humorous moment, and was probably the only way they could continue with his transformation, as we see in the next line. The barber groomed his body so hairy, anointed with oil, he turned into a man. He put on a garment, became like a warrior, he took up his weapon to do battle with lions. Very rapidly now, Enkidu is assimilating into Uruk, and he is given both a role to perform and a tool by which he may complete his task. When at night the shepherds lay sleeping, he struck down wolves, 
He chased off lions. Sleeping lay the senior shepherds, their shepherd boy Inkadu, a man wide awake. This shows that Inkadu has been fully transformed from his original state as a wild man who protected creatures of the wild into a civilized man that now battles against creatures of the wild. Now that Inkadu has been civilized, he is soon made aware of the conflict in Uruk. In true Sumerian fashion, a man comes out to the sheep pen to find Inkadu and tell him about Gilgamesh. The man begins his explanation. I was invited to the wedding banquet. It is the lot of the people to contract a marriage. I shall load the ceremonial table with tempting foods for the wedding feast. For the king of Uruk, the town square, the veil will be parted for the one who picks first. For Gilgamesh, the king of Uruk, the town square, the veil will be parted for the one who picks first. He will couple with the wife-to-be, he first of all, the bridegroom after. By divine consent it is so ordained. When his navel cord was cut, for him she was destined. So the first question, why is this unnamed man the one that delivers the news of Gilgamesh's tyranny to Inkadu? Well, we see that he has a role that he must partake in for the ceremony, and so he is connected to the wedding in a very public and open way. And so this unnamed man may feel particularly guilty of what has been decided to happen with the bride, and that is why he is seeking out Inkadu in the sheep pen of Uruk. Yet there isn't a hint that the man feels any guilt by the tone in which he speaks about Gilgamesh, because I would imagine that it would be a taboo for a citizen of a low rank to talk ill of the king. Yet we know that the man is distressed because Shemat had asked in line P145, Where do you hurry to, fellow? What is your journey so toilsome? And rather than responding to Shemat, the man speaks directly to Inkadu. So we can tell here that the man specifically set out to find Inkadu and present the struggle of Uruk before him. Upon hearing this news, Inkadu's face paled in anger. There is a fragment of nine lines missing after this detail. And when we are told that off goes Inkadu with Shamat following. So Inkadu enters the city of Uruk, the town square, and the crowd of people gather around him and describe him as, In build he is the image of Gilgamesh, but shorter in stature and bigger of bone. I thought this was such a smart detail because it's more precise in comparing Inkadu to Gilgamesh than the shepherds had been earlier, and it makes sense that they would have a more well-acquainted image of Gilgamesh because he resides amongst them within the city of Uruk. So the people are rejoicing because they believe Inkadu is their champion, that this was the rival sent to contest against Gilgamesh. Just leading up to the fight between Enkidu and Gilgamesh, there's a lot of anaphora used. The land of Uruk was standing around him. The land was gathered about him. A crowd was milling about before him. The menfolk were thronging around him. This rhythm is created to build anticipation focused on Enkidu. He's completely enveloped by the people so thankful for his arrival because they know why he's there. Like a babe in arms, they were kissing his feet. This display tells us a few things. First, that there is a recognition of social rank and that the citizens perceive that difference between themselves and Enkidu. In May of 2023, an article was released by El Pais explaining accounts of kissing recorded in ancient Mesopotamia. The author states the following. Sumerian texts speak of kissing as the act after sex. Meanwhile, some Akkadian tablets from the civilization north of Sumerian mention kissing the feet or the ground walked upon as a show of respect or submission to parents or priests, while others mention kissing as a manifestation of sexual desire. In this instance, kissing is used by the citizens of Uruk to show their respect and submission to Enkidu. Finally, the confrontation between Inkadu and Gilgamesh begins at line 111. Inkadu with his foot blocked the door of the wedding house, not allowing Gilgamesh to enter. 
They seized each other at the door of the wedding house, and the street they joined combat in the square of the land. The door jam shook, the wall did shudder, and the street Gilgamesh and Inkadu joined combat in the square of the land. The door jam shook, the wall did shudder. So here, the actual fight is swift and occurs over eight lines of verse. There is an emphasis made on the sensory details of the door jam shaking and the wall shuddering in order to showcase the massive force generated by Enkidu and Gilgamesh fighting all the way in the street. There is another gap in the tablet, but we get the substitution of the Pennsylvania tablet. Gilgamesh knelt, one foot on the ground. His anger subsided, he broke off from the fight. After he broke off from the fight, said Enkidu to him, to Gilgamesh, As one unique your mother bore you, the wild cow of the fold, the goddess Nin's son. High over warriors, you are exalted to be king of the people, Elil made it your destiny. So here we see Gilgamesh and Enkidu are an equal match for one another in strength. Enkidu isn't fighting to defeat or conquer Gilgamesh. He's only trying to stop him in order to reason with him. So the fight between the two of them stops when Gilgamesh calms down from his angry outburst against Enkidu. This then begins Enkidu reasoning with him, reminding Gilgamesh of his acclaim by the people and his position as king divinely given by the god Elil. At this point, the Pennsylvania tablet ends and the sequel Yale tablet is used to supplement our reading for this segment. But it is not well preserved. Why do you desire to do this thing? anything. Do you want so much? Let me, a feat that never was done in the land. They kissed each other and formed a friendship. This is such a pivotal point, and we don't presently know what Enkidu said to Gilgamesh, other than Enkidu offering to do something either for or with Gilgamesh that is a feat that has never been done in the land. It's hard to determine if it is the genesis of their plan to take on Humbaba, that comes later in the epic, or if it's something completely different. It seems like it's possible, but there isn't enough context existing for us to determine the words given by Enkidu to gain the friendship of Gilgamesh. After the establishment of their friendship, we return to the standard Babylonian tablet, and the two of them have gone to Ninsan so that Gilgamesh can introduce Enkidu to his mother. In this segment, there are around 15 lines that are again heavily fragmented that make it difficult to pick up what Ninsan is saying to Gilgamesh. From what we can gather, Ninsan is comparing the nature and possessions of and between Enkidu and Gilgamesh, highlighting their differences. I think when it says, my son, in his gate, bitterly you, and jumping to line 176, bitterly he, Enkidu possesses no keith or kin, shaggy hair hanging loose. He was born in the wild and has no brother. It's really unclear as to why this is of significance for Ninsan to mention this information, but as a result, Enkidu hears this, and thinking it over, he sat down weeping, his eyes rimming with tears, his arms fell limp, his strength ebbed away. This is a very strong visual detail they provide. They took hold of each other, and they linked their hands like. So Gilgamesh is comforting Enkidu and asking what is wrong with Enkidu, and there is a repetition of sensory details. We discover that Enkidu's heart is aggrieved, that terror has entered his heart. So whatever Ninsan explained to the two of them, Enkidu had not previously been aware of. I think it's interesting that this is the second time in which the awareness of Enkidu has been enlarged by the counsel of a woman, for Shamat, and now the mother of Gilgamesh, goddess Ninsan. This recurring pattern seems to represent women as beings that symbolically birth change in others. In a way, you can even accredit the women of Uruk as birthing the creation of Enkidu as it was the voicing of their troubles to the goddesses that made divine action take place. This also signifies that women display a very important role in the society of Uruk on the basis of spiritual leadership. And this leadership is not exemplified through physical strength or power, 
but by duty through service to others. So Enkidu shares why he's distressed, that terror has entered his heart, and Gilgamesh gives his plan of action, that ferocious Humbaba, let us slay him, so his power is no more. In the forest of cedar where Humbaba dwells, let us frighten him in his lair. Somehow, for some reason, Humbaba brings terror to Enkidu. Maybe Humbaba was referenced in the missing pieces earlier when they were talking about the gate. It's not clear. So Gilgamesh and Enkidu talk about Humbaba at length, and this is the primary way in which we get an idea of who this figure is and why he matters. The origin of the name Humbaba is unknown, but we do know that Humbaba guards the forest of cedar. It's believed this forest that they're referencing was most likely the cedar forest of Lebanon. This species of cedar can grow up to between 100 to 130 feet tall. Additionally, this cedar can live for more than a thousand years. So this demonstrates that Humbaba guards what is most likely considered an ancient forest. We discover that Enkidu knew Humbaba when he was in the uplands and are given more insight into his character. Looking at line Y110, Enkidu explains, Humbaba, his voice is the deluge, his speech is fire, and his breath is death. Why do you desire to do this thing? An unwinnable battle is Humbaba's ambush. This characterizes Humbaba as having a strength far different from that of Gilgamesh or Enkidu. Humbaba has a terrible metaphysical strength, one in which Enkidu considers to be unconquerable. Gilgamesh responds by simply saying, I will climb, my friend, the forest slopes. This seems to indicate that he doesn't really understand who or what Humbaba is, and Enkidu carries on to explain, My friend, how can we go to the home of Humbaba? So to keep safe the cedars, Elil made it his lot to terrify men. That is a journey which must not be made. That is a man who must not be looked on. He who guards the forest of cedar, his reach is wide. Humbaba, his voice is the deluge. His speech is fire. His breath is death. He hears a forest murmur at sixty leagues distance. Who is there would venture into his forest? A dad ranks first and Humbaba second. So here we see that Humbaba is believed to have supernatural abilities. Just for reference, a league is equivalent to... 6.71 miles, and so 60 leagues would be around 403 miles. So in this section, Enkidu is trying to be very emphatic with trying to impress upon Gilgamesh that Humbaba is a divine being whose role has been given by the gods to guard the cedar forest and that they should not so much as look upon Humbaba. Gilgamesh responds by saying, Why, my friend, do you speak like a weakling? With your spineless words, you make me despondent. As for a man, his days are numbered. Whatever he may do is but the wind. Exists not for me. So for whatever reason, Gilgamesh believes that they ought to take action because their life is finite. He then reassures Enkidu that he is an experienced fighter and that they should begin their journey by heading to the forge. So Enkidu and Gilgamesh go hand in hand to the forge, and this symbolically demonstrates they are becoming one on this journey. They have the smiths make them each a hatchet and dagger. We are given the weight and composite of each, and they provide it in a unit of talent. I had always thought that talent referred only to money, and it makes sense that it would be so closely related to weight. So, I could only find something about Sumerian and Babylonian talents on Wikipedia. It explains that a talent was made up of 60 minas, and then one mina was made up of 60 shekels. So with this information, one talent would have been equivalent to about 30.2 kilograms, or 66 pounds and 9 ounces. There seems to be a slight discrepancy in the text where it states, Gilgamesh and Enkidu bore 10 talents each. I think maybe in total they carried 10 talents, three talents apiece for an axe, and then two talents apiece for a dagger. Together they would hold 
302 kilograms or 665.796 pounds. And yeah, that's a little close to a certain number that is, by a modern reading, a symbol of evil. Certainly, there is no way that this connection could have been made knowingly, and it's only by our vantage point as modern readers that we can see that connection. So, after they've finished at the forge, Gilgamesh assembles a crowd of his people in the street of Uruk, and he sits at his throne. So he tells his people the journey that he will take, and he first speaks to his elders. Hear me, O elders of Uruk, the town square. I would tread the path of ferocious Hambaba. I would see the god of whom men speak, whose name the lands do constantly repeat. I will conquer him in the forest of cedar. Let the land learn Uruk's offshoot is mighty. Let me start out. I will cut down the cedar. I will establish forever a name eternal. Then Gilgamesh speaks to the young men of Uruk. Hear me, O young men of Uruk the sheepfold. O young men of Uruk who understand combat. Bold as I am, I shall tread the distant path to the home of Hambaba. I shall face a battle I know not. I shall ride a road I know not. Give me your blessings as I go on my journey, so I may see again your faces in safety and return glad at heart through Uruk's gate. Here we see Gilgamesh addresses the elders first, and the young men second. This demonstrates respect, and to each group he shares different information and appeals to each group in a way they can understand him and his journey. Gilgamesh then explains that he will have a New Year festival celebration held twice, that normally and then that upon his arrival. This is a further measure of Gilgamesh convincing the people of Uruk to bless him as he goes on his journey. Shortly after, Enkidu then interrupts and asks both the elders and the young men to convince Gilgamesh not to take the journey. We get a repeat of lines compositing three stanzas explaining to the people who Humbaba is. This again creates a structure and emotional drive for the listener. Finally, the senior advisors rise and they offer counsel to Gilgamesh and they begin. You are young, Gilgamesh, born along by emotion, all that you talk of, you don't understand. They then reiterate what Enkidu has said time and time again and affirms the caution that he has voiced. And the response is the following. Gilgamesh heard the words of the senior advisors. He looked with a laugh at Enkidu. Now, my friend, how frightened I am and fear of him shall I change my mind with him laughing. You can see Gilgamesh provides a sarcastic remark we see that fear is not a motivating force for Gilgamesh, that his will and desire is guided by something greater than fear can engender. And this is the conclusion of Tablet 2.